Namaskar and hello to everyone present with us in today's international webinar on religion as the axis of human society, anthropological reflection. Respected Dr. Harichandra Mohanta sir, Honorable Registrar, Tribigro University, India. Respected Professor Birinchi Kumar Medhi, retired faculty, Department of Anthropology, Gohati University, India. Respected Professor Bruno Reinhardt, Faculty, Department of Anthropology, Federal University of Santa Catarina, Brazil. Respected Chairperson of the webinar, Professor Nitul Kumar Gogoi, Head, Department of Anthropology, Debruga University, India. And all the eminent academicians, scholars, student friends, and others who are present with us today. I, Dr. Arindita Goswami, Assistant Professor, Department of Anthropology, Debruga University. On behalf of the Department of Anthropology, Debruga University, heartily welcome you all to this webinar organized by our department today. Now, I would take the opportunity to introduce our esteemed resource persons for the webinar. We have with us Dr. Harichandra Mohantasar, Honorable Registrar, Debrugar University, India, who will be delivering the keynote address for the webinar. Dr. Harishandra Mohanta had joined the Department of Anthropology, Debrugar University, Debrugar, as a lecturer in the year 1994. He obtained his master's degree from the Department of Anthropology, Guwahati University, Guwahati, and completed his PhD in anthropology from Guwahati University itself in 1996. He also completed Master of Business Administration from IGNO in 2015. Dr. Mahanta had joined as Deputy Controller of Examinations in Debruga University in 2003. And subsequently, in the year 2012, he had joined as the Controller of Examinations. In August 2018, he joined as the Registrar, Debruga University. He was also the first coordinator of Directorate of Distance Education, Debruga University, established in the year 2002, and the first member secretary of the Combined Entrance Examination 2007 cell for Medical and Engineering Entrance Examination conducted by the Debruga University. He was the man behind the examination reforms in Debruga University. In 2011, Debruga University introduced the semester system in undergraduate program and Dr. Mohanto was entrusted the job of semester examinations independently. He is presently a life member and founder member of two professional bodies of anthropo-archaeological research with Indo-Pacific Prehistory Association, Australian National University, Canberra, Australia, and Society of South Asian Archaeology, Deccan College, Postgraduate and Research Institute, Pune, respectively. He has published more than 20 research papers in national and international referred journals and presented five research papers in international conference, IPPA Congress in Taiwan 2002, Philippines 2006, Vietnam 2009, Cambodia 2014, and World Archaeological Congress Poland in 2007, in addition to contributing articles in leading journals and books. He has been awarded the Education Excellence Award by Confederation of Indian Universities International Felicitation, New Delhi in 2019 for his outstanding contribution as an educator. Sir, Welcome. We are privileged to have you with us. Next, we have with us Professor Bruno Reinhardt, Faculty, Department of Anthropology, Federal University of Santa Catarina, Brazil. He has conducted ethnographic, ethnographic fieldwork among the practitioners of Afro-Brazilian religions and Pentecostal Christians in Brazil and Ghana. His works orbit around the relation between religious pedagogy, authority and power, religious apprenticeship and ethics. He has published a book 
and various book chapters and articles and is now working on a book manuscript about the pedagogy of a Ghanaian Pentecostal seminary. I welcome you, sir, to our event. Professor Bruno will be speaking on economic theology and Pentecostal calling. And now I take the opportunity to introduce our third resource person for the webinar, who also happens to be my teacher and PhD supervisor, respected Professor Birinchi Kumar Medhi. Professor Medhi, retired faculty and head, Department of Anthropology, Guwahati University, India, is the first person to conduct a systematic study on the Assamese Sikh community of Assam, for which he received his PhD in 1990. He also holds an additional MA degree in Assamese from Guwahati University. He has successfully guided 32 PhD research scholars up till now. He has to his credit more than 100 research papers published in national and international journals and edited book on different themes ranging from material culture to social relations, health, religion, art and craft, social structure, urban problems and ethnicity among others. Immensely popular with students for his amiable and welcoming nature, he was felicitated as living anthropologist in 2012 at the Kalinga Institute of Industrial Technology, University and Kalinga Institute of Social Sciences, Bhuvaneshwar, Orissa. Professor Medhi also received a certificate of merit from the Honorable President of India in 1974 for his book, Ekhon Dek, Oleg Manu. Besides being a successful anthropologist, he has written innumerable novels, short stories, songs, poems, and popular articles in newspapers and magazines. He is also the recipient of the Best Lyricist Award in 2010 and 2015 in the State Film Festival Assam for Best Song in Assamese Cinema. He has composed anthems for 17 colleges and institutions in Assam. Sir, I welcome you to our webinar. Professor Medhi will be speaking on the topic, Alphabets of Religion. Now I would like to introduce the chairperson of our today's webinar, Professor Nitul Kumar Gogoi. Professor Nitul Kumar Gogoi, head, Department of Anthropology, Divrugha University, India, uh, received his PhD in 1996 from the Northeastern Hill University, Shillong, on the topic acculturation in the Brahmaputra Valley, the Ahom case. He has successfully guided more than 10 PhD research scholars up till now. His areas of interest include emerging trend in ethnicity, identity consciousness, culture studies, youth behavior, intellectual property rights, and displacement studies. I welcome you, sir, to the event. Uh, so before we begin the session, I would like to make some important announcements for our viewers and participants. Uh, I request all our viewers and participants to please avoid uh, typing any comments in the uh, chat box sec section during this session as it might uh, distract our uh, distinguished speakers during their presentation. Uh, limited queries to the resource persons will be taken up towards the end of the entire presentation. And uh, the queries can be uh, posted in the chat box section along with the name of the participants. And uh, we shall be forwarding the same to our resource persons. And uh, the formal question and answer uh, or interaction session will be followed by the observation from the chairperson, Professor Nitul Kumar Gogoi, sir, uh, which will be followed by the formal vote of thanks. So now I uh, request our honorable registrar, Dr. Horichandra Mohanta, sir, to kindly take over the session and deliver his keynote address. Sir, please. Thank you, Arindida. Uh, good evening to all. Am I audible? Good evening to all. And yes, good, morning to, good morning to yes, Professor sir. Bruno. Respected uh, chairperson, webinar organizing committee, and head of the Department of Anthropology, and also the chairperson for the Center of Studies in Social Work, Professor 
নিতুল কুমার গগৈ রেসপেক্টেড প্রফেসর বীরেন্সি কুমার মেধি ফরমার ফ্যাকাল্টি এন্ড হেড অফ দি ডিপার্টমেন্ট অফ এন্থ্রোপোলজি গুহাটি ইউনিভার্সিটি ইন্ডিয়া রেসপেক্টেড প্রফেসর ব্রুনো রেইনহার্ট ফ্যাকাল্টি ডিপার্টমেন্ট অফ এন্থ্রোপোলজি ফেডারেল ইউনিভার্সিটি অফ সান্টা ক্যাটারিনা ব্রাজিল ডক্টর অরিন্দিতা গোস্বামী কনভেনার এন্ড মডারেটর অফ দিস ওয়েবিনার মাই ডিয়ার পার্টিসিপেন্টস একাডেমিশিয়ান টিচার্স রিসার্চ স্কলার্স এন্ড দিয়ার স্টুডেন্টস ইট গিভস মি ইম মাইস প্লেজার টু বি a part of this international webinar on religion as the axis of human society anthropological reflection as the keynote speaker i take this opportunity to give my thanks to the organizing committee and also welcome you to this online platform I want to start my address with a great quote of Karl Marx. Religion is the importance of human mind and deal with occurrences it cannot understand. It can openly be admitted that in defining religion, most of the Indian thinkers follow the definition given by the Western thinkers. as the western thinkers believe that the religious approach is theistic in its nature so the indian thinkers maintain that religion is some form of theism this view of western thinkers seems to be an echo of a scottish theologian and philosopher robert flint according to flint both theism and religion is one and the same thing he says that impossibility of anything more than theism similarly there is no religion which is less than theism this point is stated by william james in another way he says anything sort of god is not rational anything more than god is not possible another definition of religion is given by galway which is definitely applicable applicable to theism according to him man's fate in a power beyond himself whereby he seek to satisfy emotional needs and gains stability of life and which he expresses in acts of worship and serve <clears throat> by this definition galway tries to maintain that the essential features of religion is a fate in a power beyond man who is satisfies the emotional aspects of man in explaining the meaning of religion tyler says that religion is the belief in spiritual beings but his explanation of the meaning of religion does not satisfy a rational mind as he does not give us a clear picture of the nature of spiritual being there are three different aspects of religious consciousness likely intellect feeling and action but while defining religion different thinkers emphasize either of the other according to herbert spencer religion is a type of hypothesis by which people attempts to comprehend the universe his definition that emphasizes the intellectual aspects of religion other thinkers like mac taggart emphasizes on the emotional aspects neglecting other aspects similarly fraser definition of religion emphasizes only the evolution and action but the definition of religions seems to be more or less satisfactory is put forward by robert clay 
as he embraces all the three aspects of religion. According to him, religion is man's belief in a being or beings mightier than himself and inaccessible to his senses, but not indifferent to his sentiments and action. With the feeling and practices which flow from such a belief. There are so many definitions of religion given by different thinkers at different periods of history, but none can give us a complete picture of it. Religion is hard to define, not because there is so little of it, but because there is so much. It is fact that God is the central element of religion and men have There is a problem with the audio, I guess. Yes, sorry, sorry for the interruption. Am I audible? Yes. Am I audible? Yes, yes. yes sir. Yes. yes, sir. Sorry. Yes, sir. Interruption. Now you're audible. Yes. So uh, there are so many definitions of religion given by different thinkers at different periods of history, but uh, none can give a complete picture of it. Religion is hard to define, and not because there is so little of it, but because there is so much. It is fact that God is the central element of religion, and men have implicit confidence on him, and they exercise all their attempts to make commune with him. Thus, without mentioning this aspect of religion, no definition of it can give us complete picture of religion. There are different theories regarding the origin and concept of religion, but it cannot be certainly said that when and how religious ideas emerged in men. It is also certainly cannot be said that what is the origin of the ideas of religion. All these are due to the fact that there is no broad consensus amongst the thinkers of the field regarding the origin of religion. But there are people who firmly believe that religious ideas are instinctive in man. No other animals except man bear these instinctive features. Man can be distinguished from other animals from two angles, reason and religion. Man possesses reason while other animals do not. And that is why men are called rational animals. Similarly, men are religious while other animals are not. Men bear both finite and infinite features. At the very inception of human race on earth, men were totally ignorant about the different events that occurred in nature around them. But they were curious to know the happening and accordingly, they applied their own efforts. They had to face the different natural calamities like storms, floods, lightning, dangerous animals, famine, etc. And they were unable to overcome these situations. As a result, they had to imagine an invisible power mightier than themselves, upon whom they depended for assistance, strength, and relief. 
Thus, fear and curiosity are the main factors responsible for the emergence of religious tendency in ancient people. They also believe that this unseen and invisible power would be helpful in their birth, sorrow, old age, and finally in obtaining salvation. They sometimes conceived God as their object of love. There are different forms such as father, friend, lover, beloved, master, through which they try to attain relation with God. Thus, in order to meet their ignorance and to get strength and courage to face natural calamities, men time and again dependent on an imaginary existence, the result of which is named God in religion. There are different aspects of religion, such as internal and external, individual and social. In religious consciousness, an emotional element is present. The emotional element are ideas, thoughts, and feelings. Not only that, it also concerns man's relation to God. Thus, these emotional elements as well as intellectual elements are referred by internal aspects. <clears throat> Apart from this, an important aspect of religion is practical activities such as rites and ceremonies. These practical activities are different ways through which men express their religious feelings. Thus, these practical activities are referred in external aspects of religion. But although it is claimed that God is the central element of religion, there are religion without God or gods. Some of these religions are Buddhism, Jainism, and Kong's religion of humanity. Crowley also hold that the fundamental feature of religion is sacred ceremony. He believes that religion is possible without making any reference to God or gods. But there are thinkers who are of the opinion that without reference to God, the true sense of religion is not possible. Many other claim that those who do not believe the reality of God in their religion, there is reference of communion between man and something beyond man in their religion. Religion is in fact an individual matter. It is individual who acquires religious experience and he has conviction on it. He personally realizes religious experiences in his life. He believes that salvation can be attained through performing religious activities. But in a social, but to a social philosopher, social aspect of religion is more important and carries greatest significance. The social aspect is emphasized by all the great religions of the world. It is because of the fact that religion plays an important role in maintaining social unity, its promotion and maintenance. The religion which emphasizes this social aspect is the religion of humanity, although in traditional sense, this aspect is not recognized as religion. In emphasizing the social aspect of religion, Blackmore and Glynn, the famous sociologist, says that without community worship, no religious faith can survive for a long time. They are of the opinion that a living religion may lose all its importance if the believer and worshiper of that religion ceases to worship together. 
as religion so its institution also plays an important role in social life none can deny the fact that the different kind of social institutions such as domestic economic political influence on religious institutions but it is also true that these institutions are sometimes influenced by religious institutions an important aspect of religion is prayer and different classes of people belonging to different caste of society assemble in religious institutions for performing prayer and worship but these activities their forms common feelings which thereby further generate a common sentiment and fellowship amongst the worshipper of a particular religion sometimes it is found that the members of a particular religion unite together and for the greater interest of the society they perform different humanitarian activities it is evident from the above that religious institutions perform not only their religious activities they also discharge different types of activities related to social welfare such as charitable hospitals schools homes for the homeless these institutions also run orphanages and collect money for the poor people it cannot be denied that religion has an external form of social control the different activities of the people and their different spheres of social life are still influenced by re religious rites and ceremonies people generally express their religious feelings through rituals and ceremonies it is also true that almost all the aspects of lives of primitive people were covered by religious practices although these were crude in nature and did not have any precise organization we find that there are different important occasions in our social life such as birth marriage harvesting hunting date etc and all these activities religious rites are performed in primitive societies by doing these activities they are developed a common feeling and actions which are very much other than religious functions not only in primitive societies but also in modern societies religious activities occupy an important place the different occasions of social life such as birth date marriage etc religious rites are performed similar activities are found in the event related with economic life moreover it is found that in almost all communities religious rites are common practices during various occasions in social life such as inauguration of a new building or taking etc from the above description of the role of religion in social life it is evident that a regular order of procedure is developed by religion in society and thus it helps to control the society religion helps to save the character of an individual and thereby it molds social life it brings forth in the sense of social value in the mind of people in obeying the social law or to respect the elders and to show sympathy towards the feeling of others or to discharge the social obligations faithfully the role of religion is immense in those cases it acts as a teacher not only this a sense of fellow feeling amongst the people belonging to different communities is also taught by religion moreover religion teaches that the the man's love and services to god will be real only if he loves and serves humanity in developing moral consciousness among people religion acts as an inspiring factor 
religion enforces uniformity of behavior and it strengthens social solidarity and thereby acts as an instrument in stabilizing social order. In primitive age, the influence of religion was very great in controlling society and this feature is not totally lost even today. Social life of primitive people was controlled by inspiring God fear in their minds, but in modern age, people are inspired not by fear, but by the hope for the attainment of virtuous and noble life. Thus, by fostering patriotic sentiments in man, religion helps to maintain social integration. In describing the role of religion, Dr. S. Radhakrishnan says that religion has innumerable effects. Religion not only guarantees values, but it also gives meaning to life. Moreover, the confidence to go on adventures is also inculcated in our mind by religion. Thus, narrating the role of religion, he says, religion is discipline which touches the conscience and helps us to struggle with evil and sordidness saves us from greed, lust, and hatred. Religious moral power and impart courage in the enterprise of saving the world. People live in the third world countries such as India, Africa, Brazil, etc. They derive their sense of life from religion and as such, religion is very important to them. They get the answers of many questions that appears in their minds. The questions such as who we are, what is the purpose of life, what is life and what is death? Is there anything after this life are very common for human being and they are curious to have answers of these questions. But in the third world countries, science is not so developed to answer these questions. Thus, it is religion from which the sick get answer of these questions. And for me, when I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. That's my religion. With this word, I conclude here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Arindita. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your eloquent uh, keynote address. Uh, we are really privileged to have you with us. So, uh, Next, uh, we will be uh, having the presentation from Professor Bruno Reinhardt. So, yes, can I you can. hear me, Professor uh, Bruno Reinhardt? I'm trying to share my screen. Is it working? Um, yeah. Okay, it is. Uh -huh. Okay, so I'll start. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, all at uh, the Brugge University the Department of Anthropology and the, the university community and also thank uh, specifically Professor Gosvani, Professor Mahanta, Professor Medi, Professor Gogoi and the technical assistant of uh, Akashtip. Um, uh, I'll read from a paper and uh, I'll elaborate in one of the the questions that which is the relationship between religion and the economy specifically um, okay so from a standard secularist and the economy are like oil and water they do not mix religion is immaterial about ultimate meanings and transcendent ends, such as salvation. 
conversely, the economy is about material subsistence, survival in the here and now, about interests, uh, instrumental reason, and maximization. Uh, however, uh, many social scientists uh, appear to disagree and stress how such intuitive opposition uh, has recent origins and reflects major changes affecting and indeed producing the categories of religion and economy in secular modernity. Uh, so it is telling, for instance, that the term belief, which it, uh, we consider typical, is examined in the economic section of Emile Benveniste's uh, Dictionary of Indo-European Concepts and Society. Uh, Benveniste shows how both the Vedic and the Latin roots uh, for belief, uh, sada and credo, refer to economic obligations, a sequence linking a donation to a remuneration. Uh, to believe, uh, he says, is to give something away with the certainty of getting it back. Uh, so to produce the Ari logic, Bruno, yes, Professor Bruno, yes, uh -huh. uh, uh, yeah, your, your voice voice is uh, not clear. Can you please adjust your mic? My mic, okay. There so is maybe some I'll change in, in, yeah. too much noise. Okay. Uh, uh, um, the, the, you can adjust the position of the mic, sir. Yes, just a second. Is this better? Is it better? Yes, yes I think I guess this oh, is better. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I get it. I get hitting on my mouth and making some noise, so sorry. So I was talking generally about the relationship between religion and the economy and how even in the terminology of the, ter of the verb and the substantive uh, uh, to believe and belief, we find uh, commerce and economic relations defining it, right? Um, um, so despite Emile Durkheim's own association of economic activities to the realm of the profane, to which he opposed sacred religious rituals, many scholars in the French school of anthropology have stressed the deep entanglements between religion and the economy. So uh, Francois Simeon, for instance, he argued for the religious origins of money as a social and material token of trust and trade. Oh, trust and value, sorry. Whereas uh, Marcel Moos and Georges Bataille have both approached sacrifice as a sacred economic endeavor, one that binds uh, humans and gods through a logic of either credit or expenditure. Uh, we could say that the time lag, the temporal interval between giving and receiving, is exactly where religious beliefs gain social productivity. And the same can be applied to monetary systems or any other social institutions, which are ultimately based on collective belief in faith, in credit and credibility. Um, so we could say that we are living now in many countries like Brazil, a crisis of faith in liberal democracies. Um, one way of correcting the opposition I started with, that between ultimate religious values and economic values, is recognizing its specificity. It does not apply to any society, but only to modern capitalist societies, in which religion and the market economy are deemed autonomous domains of social reality. Uh, yet, uh, scholars have, have also problematized this divide within capitalist modernity itself. For instance, uh, sociologist Max Weber and economist Richard Tony have shown how capitalism was actually formed, among other forces, by religion. Uh, more exactly, uh, Protestant Christianity. Uh, Max Weber did that through his thesis on the elective affinities between the ethics of Protestant sects and the rationalized pursuit of profits, uh, 
an affinity which rendered worldly pursuits uh, a holy enterprise based on God's calling. Uh, Tony argued that Protestant morality had a critical impact on the separation between morality and trade, helping to unleash economic entrepreneurship from medieval regulations concerning us uh, usury, which was uh, considered a sin. Um, philosopher Walter Benjamin went a step forward and argued in an incomplete essay that capitalism was not only shaped by its religion, but he claims that it is a religion. Uh, so for Benjamin, capitalism had morphed into a pure cult without God and without theology. Uh, withholding the hope of redemption and the promise of salvation from its adherents, capitalism instead increased the sense of guilt and debt, uh, which are moral and economic words, right? Guilt uh, and debt, that indeed are homonymous in Germany. It's the same word, shoot. So he relays the economic and the moral, even in the terminology, uh, in the history of the, the grammar. Right? So all the authors above um, avoid uh, debating the relationship between religion and the economy, both past and present, as the encounter of two ontologically distinct domains of life. This is exactly what many scholars who diagnose the marketization of religion today uh, do. In fact, they assume that religion and economics are autonomous and then show how they become entangled, usually uh, through a normative reasoning that understands such mixture as bad. I, am I still on? Are you, are you there? <laughs> Yes, okay. sir. Please okay. continue. Because your, your Please continue, went off. sir. Yeah. Uh, okay. So today I would uh, I would like to try a different strategy uh, to leave the definition of religion and the economy open to an ethnographic inquiry, and see what emerges from it. I like to do this having in mind the question of how a recent and polemical trend of uh, Pentecostal Christianity which is usually called neo-Pentecostalism, relates to the economic spirit of our times, uh, neoliberalism. Uh, many scholars in the social sciences have indeed assumed that we live in a neoliberal age, an age in which market principles have advanced over almost every domain of life previously protected from them. Uh, another widely shared diagnostic about our time is that we are living a resurgence of religion in the public sphere, which has challenged uh, the secularist assumption that modernization necessarily entails uh, right, the withdrawal of religion from public life. Uh, in this presentation, I'm interested in exploring how these two historical forces, right, uh, neo-Pentecostalism and neoliberalism, uh, overlap in the case of neo-Pentecostal Christianity a highly influential religious movement that has grown in the so-called so Global South uh, by allying uh, uh, Pentecostalism classics focus on biblical inerrancy, holiness, and a direct expression of God through the Holy Spirit with modernist values and strategies such as entrepreneurship, cultural globality, and mediatic forms of interpolation. Uh, it is interesting to notice that this last and most impacting wave of Pentecostal growth started in the two last decades of the 20th century and coincided with the neoliberal reforms of the state aimed at amplifying the scope of market economies, reforms often spearheaded by the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, many authors have reflected about such temporal coincidence and asked themselves how these economic and religious forces overlap. Uh, they have asked in some if the neo in neo-Pentecostalism is the neo in neoliberalism, uh, a problem I like to pursue uh, here. So let me just change a bit. Um, Uh, so scholars who engage uh, with the question, with this question, uh, have reached uh, various answers, 
And because of the brevity of time, I systematized them in five trends before presenting my argument. Uh, the first and most intuitive way of engaging with this question has been through uh, what I'm calling deprivation theories, which represent the neo-Pentecostal revival as a causal reaction to the economic uncertainty and precarity unleashed by neoliberal reform. So increase of informal, of the informal economy, for instance, uh, a, certain, a certain precarization of uh, work conditions has generated um, uh, a certain audience and a new public to a new Pentecostal church is especially because they uh, uh, they use uh, they embrace what they call a prosperity theology. So this is the first way of approaching this link. Uh, the second one. Uh, so similarly to deprivation theories, the second kind of approach is also heavily centered on prosperity rituals, but it relates neo Pentecostalism to neoliberalism epiphenomenally or in terms of representation. Uh, so Jean and John Komaroff's uh, thesis on millennial capitalism are the best example of this analytical current. They incorporate neo-Pentecostalism into neoliberal culture and ally their prosperity rituals with both global secular phenomena, such as gambling, the stock market, and lottery, uh, which have run, uh, uh, right? So all these phenomena would be cultural elaborations, which they qualify as magical, uh, upon the erratic nature of value and accumulation in neoliberal financial capitalism. Um, so the third approach is centered on religious markets. And the question he here is not so much how neo-Pentecostalism responds to the neoliberal economy, right, taken as an infrastructural entity, but how economic deregulation has allowed neo-Pentecostalism to actually produce market niches, especially through religious media, right? So the increasing mediatization of religion has, and mediatization has produced true uh, commodities, and this has generated a sort of marketization in the sense that one of the ways that um, neo-Pentecostalism spreads is through the communication market. Um, whereas the third approach privileges uh, neo-Pentecostalism in the public sphere, the fourth approach is oriented to Pentecostalist developmental ethics and has realigned the study of Pentecostalism with Marx Weber's thesis on the affinities between Protestantism and capitalist work ethics. Uh, it differs from all the approaches above, um, now on the fourth one, um, uh, it differs from all the approaches above by taking the ethnographic focus away from ritual context, be then uh, either face-to-face -face or mediatized, and towards the everyday of converts, including the, the complementarities and tensions between prosperity theology, other Pentecostal norms and its spheres of exchange, and the actual shaping of economic uh, networks. Right? So the, the approach here is on how neo-Pentecostal pedagogy, their uh, teachings in the sense of practical teachings, instill a sort of entrepreneurial um, ethos, uh, entrepreneurial ethics and disposition, and allows their uh, the, this converse to actually shape uh, commercial and economic and networks in the market. And so the fifth approach emphasizes how neo Pentecostal organizations have filled the void left by the neoliberal state in the welfare sector, becoming a major force in the field of humanitarianism. So Kevin O'Neill's ethnography of Pentecostal gang prevention programs in Guatemala shows how Christian disciplines become deeply entangled both politically, economically, and ethically, with broader assemblages that include international development agencies, the state, and what he calls soft security corporations. So by outsourcing the mission of securing the soul uh, to faith-based uh, organizations, the secular state ultimately transferred to these religious groups uh, its own biopolitical power to make live and let uh, die. So a similar process can be found over the global south and north through and right through a growing structure of Pentecostal-run uh, rehab centers, charity, 
health, charity uh, programs. So the idea here is that neoliberalism stimulates a sort of reduction of the state in the welfare sector. And the neo-Pentecostal churches have actually filled this void and as a civil uh, player uh, on the social contract. Right? Um, so my research among Pentecostal Christians in Ghana was not originally centered on economic questions, which have, I have only recently started to think about more carefully. Uh, during 15 months of fieldwork, uh, mostly in Accra, Ghana's capital, I was concerned mainly with religious pedagogy, uh, with how one becomes a Pentecostal minister, which led me to focus on Pentecostal seminaries or Bible schools. Uh, the popularity of the ministerial vocation among the Ghanaian youth, however, always interrupted my how questions with why questions, questions of motivation, such as why so many people consider themselves called by God to embrace full-time ministry in Ghana? And, and what are the norms that frame and help to disseminate the call to pastorship in this religious movement? And one of the institutions where I sought answers to these questions was Lighthouse uh, Chapel International. Let me just show some pictures. Um, which I'll call from now on LCI. Uh, LCI is a new Pentecostal denomination founded in Accra at the early 1980s which has become since then a transnational network of over 1,500 branches uh, worldwide, including a few in India. Uh, such capacity to grow and replicate steadily is based on a number of rationalized strategies of what they call church growth and church planting. Uh, as an organization, LCI overlaps an eschatological ethics of conviction, right, concerned with salvation in building the kingdom, and what they call the kingdom of God, right? With highly professionalized, uh, with a highly professionalized work ethics, which draws explicitly from neoliberal rationality, from sort of management uh, tools that come from the secular economy, right? Um, so I have come to approach this particular relationship in terms of an economic theology. Uh, which I believe differs significantly from the five trends I mentioned uh, before. So now I'll speak a little bit about what I mean by economic theology. Uh, so the term economic theology has been popularized recently as referring to the study of the forms of interaction between theological imaginaries on the one hand, and economic thought and economic managerial practices on the other, both past and present. Uh, it derives especially from philosopher Giorgio Agamben's The Kingdom and the Glory, uh, where he presents a genealogy of the secular economy based on early Christian appropriations of the classic uh, Greek concept of oikonomia. Uh, so Agamben pays special attention to two events the Apostle Paul's uh, early abstraction of oikonomia into a providential economy of salvation and the patristic, uh, so the patristic era, uh, the patristic conception of the Trinitarian God, the Christian God is Trinitarian, right? itself as a divine oikonomia. So the Christian God will be an oikonomia made of three persons, right? Uh, and this uh, oikonomia founds an imminent praxis of government whose supermundane mystery coincides with the history of humanity. Uh, so Agamben's project since then, embraced by other scholars, is focused on tracing in time the transfiguration of the divine oikonomia into secular mechanisms of social harmonization, such as the invisible hand of early liberalism and the 19th century ontologization of the market as a law-giving entity and the neoliberal management of personhood as human capital. So the idea is to trace a genealogy in which uh, particular Christian concepts, especially the Christian appropriation of this concept of oikonomia, uh, has been at the roots of liberalism and this notion that there is an agent called the market, right? And the market is producing this providential force, which is development, progress, 
so it's in a way the transference of economic uh, properties from Christianity to capitalism. That's his main um, concern, right? Uh, as an anthropologist of religion, my use of this concept is ethnographic and in many ways reversed, uh, as I am concerned with religious appropriations of secular economic models of flourishing. Right? So despite this major difference, I believe uh, the concept of economic theology enables a non-reductionist approach to the relation between neo-Pentecostalism and neoliberalism. It does so because rather than reducing Christianity to an epiphenomenal role or framing the marketization of religion as a recent and exogenous colonization of religion by the market, as if they were very different forces, right? economic theology locates the economy at the very heart of the Christian tradition. Um, it enables me to retain the place of God within the economy of Christian organizations, Right? And in LCI's case, to trace the authoritative overlapping of Christian transcendence, right? questions of salvation, and neoliberal immanence, uh, questions of uh, organization and management. Uh, Arindita, if you could tell me if I'm running out of time, because I probably will, so it would be nice if you give me a, a sign. Yeah, sir, sir, you have time till 7 4. You have your uh, time mm. limit. It's uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Ten, 10 more minutes, let's say? Um, oh, yeah, okay, 10 12 minutes. Uh -huh. I'll keep my eye here. Thank you. You, you can have uh, 10 to 12 minutes, sir, at your hand. You have. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Just updating. <laughs> uh, so I'll show one of example of their uh, of lighthouse chapels economic uh, theology. So, for instance, in his church administration in a manual uh, used as a textbook in LCI seminary, where the pastors are trained, right? So Bishop Deck Howard Mills, which is the denomination's founder, describes a charismatic vision, which I am. Um, um, it's on your screen, the whole, I will not read the whole thing. But, and so he describes um, a vision in which God has called him to industrialize his church. And God showed him that as the success of the nations of the world depends on their producing something, the success of the church depends on her producing souls. God urged him to become a businessman for God. Those are his words, right? whose currency is human souls. Uh, referring to Jesus' uh, biblical command to occupy until I come, until Jesus' second coming, right, which is part of the Christian uh, tradition, uh, Howard Mills concludes with a warning. Jesus expects us to take the business of soul winning as a very serious enterprise. Soul winning should be intentional and not incidental. Uh, Howard Mill's discourse is consciously controversial and challenges those who accuse churches like LCI of being a business in religious disguise, not through a defensive accommodation to a rhetoric of authenticity, but through an explicit Christian pragmatism. He claims that LCI is indeed a business, right? a soul-winning industry envisioned and authorized by God. Uh, his testimony exemplify how Right? As a theoeconomic, as a theological and economic project, uh, LCI is grounded on a calculative religious reason in which the quantitative drive of evangelism, the Christian duty to save souls, right? as an eschatological duty, illegitimizes the Christian encompassment of instrumental reasons and economic reasons. Right? So it is important to stress that LCI's vision of a flourishing church is not solely quantitative or evangelistic, as they say, based on the mass production and accounting of souls. And LCI preachers indeed constantly criticize in public what they call large and barren churches. So churches that accumulate passive souls who do not work for God. So there is a, a constant uh, encouragement of people to be themselves active in church life, right? 
So in order to achieve fertility, uh, LCI adds a qualitative or what I call apostolic dimension to its government structures, which incites effective engagement with pastoral activities. So for instance, according to the church, 80% of the activities are performed by lay leaders, not by uh, ordained uh, ministers. And a process they call discipleship, so the, the creation of disciples. So discipleship gives capillarity to pastoral agency through the progressive transmission of standardized practice of soul winning, as they're called, and caring to convert themselves, such as knocking, the, those are their terms, right? Knocking, which means practicing home-to-home -home evangelism in groups, um, caring, which is reminding recent converts to come to church, a shepherding, which is praying for others, counseling them, reading the Bible together. Uh, interaction, which is building personal relations. And deep sea fishing, gaining access to converts' homes and mentoring them in the basics of Christianity. Uh, so my argument here is that those are all basic uh, religious practice of any community, right? But the church makes a lot of effort to sort of standardize them as units of what I call immaterial labor, right? Which is a concept from the sociology of work, contemporary sociology of work has used this notion that, um, especially in service, in the service economy, right? How the capacity to build human relationships is considered an economic skill, right? An ability that must be honed and, and cultivated in exchange for a profit, right? So my argument is that the church also operates in this way that it rationalizes this, the human relationships as a sort of pattern of labor units, let's say, right? And transfers these labor units to their converts. And in the end of the day, the converts themselves do much uh, of the work for the denomination. By doing so, they become aware during this process of enskillment, let's say, of religious learning, embodied learning, right? They become attuned or aware uh, to uh, to God's voice, to their, to their calling, right? Um, so how is one called by God to give oneself as both, pro as both product and cog to this so many industry. Um, so first, LCI's vision of a maximizing God is reflected in a democratizing approach to the calling. So commenting during a camp meeting on Jesus' famous declaration that many are called, but few are chosen, Howard Mills, which is their leader, right, criticize how pastors from large and barren churches often draw attention exclusively to the later, later sentence. Um, in order to monopolize leadership. And he countered that with plain evangelistic math. So if you were God and you had 6 billion people to save, what would you do? Would you send one or two people to save them or would you send a lot of people? Of course, you would send many people in the field of harvest. Right? So this, again, this uh, economic reasoning and part of this economic reasoning is a particular notion of God's calling which is not exclusive at all, it's very generous, right? So God calls everyone to be a minister. And how do you figure that out? You examine your desires. So one, one of the way that you recognize you, yourself as called or not in this denomination is actually uh, uh, desiring it, right? So your desire to become a pastor is God's calling in your heart, right? Uh, so it's a very minimalist notion of the calling and it's very different from most of the notions of the divine calling in Ghana, which are very extraordinary, right? So related to dreams, to visions and all this, right? So according to this church, to be called by God is simply to desire to do the work of God. Um, so let me talk a little bit about this notion of the calling, right? Um, so we may compare this church labor ethics uh, to Max Weber's approach to the Calvinist calling. 
right? Weber's uh, classic book on the spirit of capitalism, Protestantism. So according to Weber, the opacity of one's status as elected or not, right? Uh, knowing or not if you are called, it encouraged among Calvinists a methodic, albeit anxious, discharge of rationalized conduct vis-a-vis -vis profit, labor, and investment within the secular economy. Um, so in the sense, if Luther was key to the secularization of Beruf, which means the calling in German, right? Uh, in the pre-modern sense of breaking the monastic monopoly over it, Calvinism uh, secularized Beruf in the modern sense of translating it into a secular vocational ethics. So you find God's calling in your, uh, in your performance uh, in the secular economy, right? Uh, so similarly to the Calvinist case, LCI also approaches the calling's opacity, right, doubts about the calling, as a springboard to a proactive and entrepreneurial rather than contemplative self, right? So doubts about the calling are solved with actively, actually engaging church work, not being contemplative over it. Um, but different from early Calvinists, uh, the denomination does not request secular labor as Christian devotion. Contrarily, it requests Christian devotion as labor. Applying the same non-incidental or professional standards of secular management uh, to God's uh, service. And so second, the calling is not only widely available among converts in LCI, but also fluid and exploratory in terms of recognition. Uh, the equation of the calling with desire uh, allows discipleship, so this process of actually learning uh, pastoral skills, right, to become a mode of recognizing retrospectively through trial and error the location and what they call the depth of one's sovereign call to pastorship. What changes with circumstances is not God's decision, if you are called or not, but the contest the context in which one bears fruit, as they call it, and attunes themselves to the, their calling. Right? So individuals often migrate through different instantiations of these discipleship networks, which become a fertile field for the active cultivation of skills, exploratory quests um, for self-knowledge and spiritual discernment about God's purpose for one's life. And as the disciplinary bar is raised in LCI's uh, seminary, which is a very, so let's say outside the seminary, the disciplinary standards are, are very low and they incite participation. But once you get to the seminary, it's a very strict discipline you find there. So many, when they get there, they abandon the prospects of becoming a full-time minister and return to late activities. And it is common knowledge in LCI that if you graduated in the school, that is, if you desire to serve God, uh, desire to serve God stood this disciplinary uh, regime, right? it means that you are authentically called uh, to be a full-time pastor. Um, so now I'm moving towards the end. I'll just mention this uh, scene, which actually shows a bit of the sort of mix of the spiritual and the economic, which I, I was uh, referring, right? Um, so another uh, one, a good example I consider of the synthesis that I'm, I'm talking about, which is a synthesis about the spiritual and the managerial, the economic and the religious, was brought to my attention by Dixon, a Kenyan seminarian at the time. It's the second quotation there. It's an interview I did. Uh, and today a missionary in his native country. So Dixon was telling me about his experience at this moment in the seminary, which they call administrative rotation. It's part of their curriculum, right? So when seminarians, they do sort of internship uh, at, uh, at church offices, right? So basically what they are doing in during this internship is, is learning administrative routines, right? Uh, accountancy, uh, doing spreadsheets about tithes, about the money the church receives, about all sorts of statistics and data. Um, 
So to my surprise, this period of bureaucratic apprenticeship extrapolated its original purpose. According to Dixon, and I, I, I read his comment, my life changed during this internship. I started putting down things that I do and I'm supposed to do. I started to draw charts about myself, <laughs> keeping myself accountable. How many times do I pray in one day? Have I prayed the prayers I'm supposed to pray? How many books do I read in a week? How many messages, how they call recorded preaching, I've soaked in or listened? Right? And I started to realize that it, has, uh, it had changed me. There's more order in my life now. It brought me closer to God. And so during, uh, during his internship, Dixon learned not only how to make spreadsheets of church attendance and tithes, he learned how to manage his own spirituality professionally, uh, reconciling neoliberal self-management and spiritual exercises. Uh, so he basically learned how to govern himself and cultivate his relationship with God through the same apparatus, the same tools that the organization uh, uses to manage its members, including himself, right? So his experience in a way condenses how one becomes simultaneously a product, a worker, and a component of this spiritual industry I'm talking about. And so the last paragraph. Um, in both, uh, in Dixon's case, so the outcome of such pedagogy, this uh, learning process, was a specific type of desire a standardized zeal, a conviction as intense as that of the popular street evangelists that flock the streets of Accra, but whose entrepreneurial drive is focused and standardized, carrying in itself the brand of LCI's transnational corporate vision. And so uh, it's through this pedagogy of desire, which in itself is where um, uh, members recognize if they're called or not, that's the, the actual, that's the, the substance uh, in which the church authority works through. And uh, that's the, actually the substance of this pedagogy, right? So it's not a pedagogy of belief necessary as a mental phenomenon, but it's a process of actually honing and cultivating a certain kind of body and disposition that displays a certain desire. This desire is definitely absolutely authentic and oriented to God. They are very zealous in this way, right? It's a, it's a, 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 at the same time, this desire is very professionalized, very managerial to a point that I cannot differentiate what is economic and what is religious, right? So that's basically my argument about this difference, this difficulty of dissociating these categories, right? So such desire is also their calling the exogenous, the external, right, yet imminent presence of a divine economist in their hearts. This is not neo-Pentecostalism reflecting neoliberalism, either consciously or unconsciously, as like in a Marxist theory, right? Uh, so it's not neo-Pentecostalism advancing the economic aims of uh, neoliberalism, right? Uh, it is an economic theology, an authoritative discourse in which neoliberal rationality has become embedded in a distinctive Christian mission uh, to span the kingdom of God with both deep zeal and managerial professionalism. And so that was my argument today. I thank you all so much. I can talk about the talk in my lecture later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bruno. Thank you so much for your presentation. So we will be we have some queries and we'll be taking it towards the end of uh, um, Professor Medhi's uh, session. Then we can have the interactive session. So uh, now I request Professor Birinchi Kumar uh, Medhi, sir, uh, you can you can please. Uh, um, you can uh, continue your presentation. You can start your um, presentation, sir. A very good evening to you all. This is a simple and brief narration entitled An Alphabet of Religion, particularly for the students and novices to tell them about the structure and nature of religion 
without knowing who is, it is not possible to evaluate the concept of religion. It is very difficult to analyze and interpret. Religion is a pivotal cultural complex of this society, invariably related to a good number of traits which, which controls the lives of the members of the society. It is the medium through which a society adjusts to its musical religious environment. For existence, man has to adjust with three types of environment, geographical, social, and religious. The relation among these environments is conspicuous. An impact of one kind of environment is easily traceable in a in other two. Fraser, 1970, in his famous book, Golden Bow, states that by religion it is mean the propitiation or conciliation of power superior to men who are believed to bind and control the course of nature and of human life. Thus defined, religion consists of two elements, a theoretical and a practical, namely a belief in power higher than man and an attempt to propitiate or please them. Of the two kinds of beliefs, clearly comes the first divine being and since we believe in the existence of divine beings, we can attempt to please them. But unless the belief leads to a corresponding practice, it is not a religion, but merely a theology. In other words, no man is religious who does not govern by his conduct in some measure for the fear or love of God. On the other hand, he had practiced the gifted to all religious beliefs is also not religion. It is believed <coughs> that oldest religion is animism, which was practiced by our hunter-gatherer forefathers. Traces of which is conspicuous even in today's many religions of the world. The formulation of theory of animism is the work of the great anthropologist E. B. Tyler and may be found in his praiseworthy book, Primitive Culture, 1871. The notion was a part of theory of primitive religion whose endeavor to account for the attribution by some peoples of a spiritual existence to animals, plants, and even in some occasion to inanimate objects. Religion has been seen from time immemorial slowly but steadily. The animistic religion of the remote past has been seen from its chaotic condition to the stage of cult and magic. In this stage, the unknown powers began to be adorned with definite form and the mystery since of the mystery cells are attributed to some specific objects. The society had now started accepting these forms as having definite 
structures and to deem with a task particular rights, folklore, and beliefs. In this way, cults were born. Art, sky, storm, and the forces related to the objects of nature now became separate with specific existences. Particular methods were evolved to each them. The spirit, the priest is one who knew the methods come into existence along with him. Musicians were also recognized in society. In this way, religion assumed the form of institution and became limited to a definite aspect of life. In these days, no distinction between body and soul, social and spiritual elements, music and religion had been made. Gradually, a good number of trades were percolated to the religion, making it a conspicuous culture complex. In sociology, the word religion is used in a wider sense than that used in religious books. A recent sociological work defines religion as those institutional systems of beliefs, symbols, values, and practices that provide groups of men with solution to their questions of ultimate being. As a, a common characteristic found among all religions is that they represent a complex of emotional feelings and attitudes toward mysterious and perplexities of life. As such, religion comprises first system of attitudes, beliefs, symbols, which are based on the assumption that certain kinds of social relations are sacred or morally imperative and sacred, a structure of activities governed or influenced by these systems. It is near to a, it is near to impossible to give a systematic description of the myriad Days <clears throat> of religion, totem, tabu, omen, evil eye, magic, prayer, sacrifice, mana, symbol, hello, folklore, crisis, right, performing arts, and innumerable traits are integrally related to religion, no trait of which is possible to separate from it. Toda is a polyandrous tribe of Nilgiri Hills, uh, India, and their mainstay is Buffalo domesticity. <clears throat> their buffaloes are divided into two strict divisions, sacred and profession, uh, sacred and profane. In Ornasal Pradesh of Northeast India, Many a tribe keep semi domesticated animals, Mithun, both frontalists, whose are used to measure their wealth according to the number of possession. And <clears throat> these animals are principally used to use for sacrifice. Except a microscopic view. All the tribes of Urunasal Pradesh traditionally profess animistic religion. Among them, five tribes, that is 
Adi Apatani Hilmiri Nisi and Tagin believe that they have been originated from a mythological father known as Abutani. And therefore, all these tribes are included in the Tani group. Although they are in the same group, their religion are not same. The Adi tribe is divided into a number of sub tribes, and among them also religions are not identical. Each tribe of Urnasal believe in innumerable supernatural distributed over cremation ground, dwelling house, forest, river, agricultural field, and so on. They do not know about the physical feature of the supernatural, and sometimes the same spirit is addressed by them as he or she, male or female. They believe that each disease or distress is caused by the evil spirit, and to overcome the situation, they appease the responsible spirit by offering country liquor and sacrificing egg, chicken, pig, even sometimes a squirrel. Donipolo is the high god of them and he is the authority of sun and moon. He is omnipotent, omniscient and omnipresent, supernatural among them. Surprisingly enough, they do not have any ritual to propitiate this high god. Sometimes he may be a piece along with some other deities, uh, annually or occasionally as a compulsion of their life. The matrilineal garus of Meghalaya have almost abandoned their pristine religion, pristine animistic religion, known as Sangsari, <laughs> and have embraced Christianity. In their Sangsari religion, the sun or Salzong was their high god. <clears throat> Salzong was never worshipped by the Garo, only when other deities were a piece, he may also be worshipped along with them. It should be noted here that celestial bodies were worshipped by different human groups, including the Hindu. <clears throat> Though religion is a highly mental thing, yet it has a social aspect and social role to play. It has been it has been a powerful agency of society and perform many important social functions. <clears throat> it explains individual sufferings. Religion serves to suit the emotions of man in times of his sufferings and disappointment and <coughs> contributes to contributes to <coughs> in, interrogation of the personality contribute to integration of the personality enhance self importance religion <coughs> expands one still infinite opposition. Man unites himself with the infinite and <coughs> feels enabled. A source of social cohesion. Religion is ultimate source of social cohesion. The primary requirement of society is the common position of social value by which 
individual control the actions of sales and others and through society is it, it is distributed the social values are never scientifically demonstrated but emanate from religious faith social welfare through religion social welfare has been conducted agency of social control religion is one of the agency for social control the consequences are resulting from behavior religion supports the focus and and at most by placing the powerful solution of supernatural behind doors religion controls the epic of human life economic life religion promotes literature art and music it gives good opportunity for friendship it has been already stated that religion is a pivotal cultural complex the fulgency of which is spectacular in almost all the dimensions of culture what is religion for a society it is an adjustment for them for adjustment with their mysterious environment this environment invariably includes the geographical and socio cultural environment in sumatra crocodiles frequently eat men and therefore to get rid of the fear of crocodile they worship it sundarban distributed over india and pakistan is full of tigers who are many there the sundar sundarban is inhabited by the hindus and the muslim and both of them are easy prey of this ferocious animal the inhabitants of the area believe that tiger is governed by a goddess namely bon bibi or bon devi who moves around the forest riding over a tiger deep the people try to appease this goddess of tiger through a ritual like other hindus like other hindu rituals but the priest of this ritual was is selected from the muslim community the andamanis do not have clear cut idea about the spirits they have many evil spirits live in sea forest mountain and integral to ancestor and disease there is neither ceremonial worship nor pro- propitiation among them the deity namely puruga is only there and supermorphic deity The Sensu, the Sensu is a semi-nomadic tribe of South India, and their religion is characterized by by the presence of number of evil spirit that influence human life. The invocation and offerings of them are organized to draw favor from this supernatural the carvis distributed over hills and plains of assam believe in a good number of spirits according to them the good spirits live in heaven and the 
Malaysia's spirits live in art, who is guiltily seek the opportunity to harm the human being. In Northeast India, no tribe has no no tribe has their spirit with anthropomorphic form and traditional community house to appease them. Professor S. C. Jun. Professor S. C. Dubey, the Indian Socialist of India, opines that clearly, as it is practiced in the villages of India, is not the Hinduism of the classical psychological system of India. For it possesses neither the metaphysical heights nor the abstracts of the letter. In the religion of the uh, of, uh, of village India, past and festival in which are prescribed and true the observing of fasting festival, they believe that they are observing the religion in their own way. All the religions of Northeast India is very rich in folklore, innumerable songs, prayers, and performing arts are indispensable related to their religion whose are transmitted from one generation to the next, principally through and colorism. In Assam, Buddha communities live in hills and plains, are believing, are basically agriculture. Each steps of their agricultural work is marked by a ritual by their own way. It is surprising to note that despite of, uh, despite of having different religion, these people practice this ritual more or less in, in the same manner. They perform the rituals integral to agriculture more or less in the same manner. They maintain the food tables, dress a bit, incest, and ob observances integral to crisis life, and strongly believe that by maintaining those they are becoming strictly religious. These communities who, those communities who have abandoned their Christian religion for a new one, among them also traces of their traditional religion could be seen, some of which are not prescribed by the new religion. Evaluation of religion need need a need a sincere effort and to interpret the data one should critically examine the available data needed with the secondary data. In this narration. I have given some of the examples from different places of India outside of some of which are outside of India also. With this example, now we know that, that religion is a very complicated thing and fill up in some of the questionnaires we cannot write a very good 
Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your brilliant presentation. So uh, it was a wonderful uh, presentation from all our three resource persons. So now it is the time to uh, uh, put forward some queries and questions that have come up in our uh, chat box section uh, to our uh, resource persons. So uh, we, we uh, I would not be able to take uh, all the um, questions uh, due to paucity of time. So there is a, uh, one question uh, uh, put forwarded to Professor Bruno Reinhardt. Uh, from Dr. Kakoli Patra Mondal. Uh, she, she writes, uh, Sir, I want to get an idea why Pentecostal denominations was particularly successful in Latin America and largely uh, in unchurched nomin nominal Roman Catholics. I, I think it is already highlighted in the comment section, sir. You can yeah, view it. Should I answer now? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes. Ah, OK. Uh -huh. So that's a very long and complex uh, question. There's different answers. And uh, so basically, the, the religious field in countries like Brazil since colonialism was shaped, was shaped by Catholicism, right? So Christianity became synonymous with Catholicism for quite a while. There was a, a, a presence of Protestant churches, but they were very secondary. And so quite recently, as I mentioned, since the 80s especially, it started really growing and having an impact on the Catholic uh, dominance uh, over Christianity, right? And um, so there's different answers and to that, but something, uh, so I don't get, it doesn't take me too long, right? So I would emphasize this element of entrepreneurship which is something that I try to emphasize in my talk today, right? So uh, there is a, uh, in the Catholic Church, considering the authority structure, uh, it's much more hierarchical, right? It tends to sort of, um, um, so in a way, is it, uh, uh, so there's different um, effects to that hierarchy, right? One of them is stability, right? So the Catholic Church has been an institution with, I don't know, 2,000 years. So historical stability is one of the positive effects of such hierarchical order, right? Uh, a negative effect will be that it is constantly uh, producing debate over nominalism as uh, the person uh, Right, so there is a tendency of Catholics, especially in countries in which Catholicism is very hegemonic, to let's say outsource their faith to priests, right? And so to have let's say low levels of everyday piety and to become very focused on let's say Sunday rituals or cultural elements like uh, uh, celebrations, like marriages and all this. So in a way, it combines with secularism. Um, in a particular way in which, you know, uh, religious and secular activities, they don't intersect, right? They, they fit. Uh, and, and one of these effects is that people have, let, generally, I would say, a low level of personal engagement, right, in the actual transmission and construction of the church. If you compare that to Pentecostals, it's quite the contrary, right? Uh, and, and today I gave an example how this church as a, and we could apply i was talking about ghana west africa but we could apply this logic also to brazil i guess right so most of these churches are built by members right so there's also um, there is a particular focus on very charismatic leaders and so 
Um, and leadership is very important in the sense of founders and prophets and all these very widely known figures and become very mediatic. But such focus on the leadership of these churches usually um, um, makes us ignore the fact that they have been built through, uh, let's say, uh, activating the personal engagement of uh, believers in their own faith, right? And also building these institutions. So uh, it has had a huge impact in Brazil, uh, right? More like margin, marginal. Uh, there's different, uh, in, in terms of class structure, you can say that there's different styles of Pentecostalism in a country like Brazil, right? But it has grown mainly since be the beginning uh, on the, uh, among the poor, right? Because it gives them these tools of uh, agency, of entrepreneurship, of actually building not only the church, but also being proactive in the labor uh, market and having some sort of discipline and to actually engage with the secular society in a more, I would say, active way, right? So there's, uh, there's a number of answers to that. But since I was talking about religion and the economy today, I would... I would emphasize this aspect. So the, the actual transference of, of skills. So we tend to think about a religion as belief usually, right? This has been a very recent uh, uh, construction, right? And so we, and belief is often understood in terms of statements of faith, right? Like if I'm a Christian, I believe that, you know, Jesus is the son of God, that he will come back. So as if, uh, religion was about a mental engagement with propositions, right? I'm more interested in thinking about religion as the set of practices, right? Practices that by engaging with them, people produce meaning in their lives, but also they actually are, uh, go through a process of, let's call this, enskillment, right? So I used a lot the word skill, right? Uh, so uh, I'm, so the question in my opinion, Opinion, a bigger difference uh, again would be on the fact that those uh, churches they transfer a lot of skills to the audience to their uh, converts, right? Whereas the Catholic Church would be more about a ritual performance that keeps those religious skills to the leadership in a way. Of course, there's a it's not that simple, but I think that uh, process of actually transferring this religious skills, which are not only religious, as the professor just mentioned, those are life skills, right? Uh, this process of transferring to believers, this set of practices, it has a huge impact on the, uh, their relationship with themselves, which become much more, let's say, uh, dignified, self-aware, and in terms of um, personal empowerment, right? And also it helps them to engage with, especially economic life, but also association or community life through those tools, right? And they and they have been very important uh, for that matter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, uh, th thank you, sir. So uh, uh, we we have another uh, another question we have from uh, uh, Karthik Lakshman. Karthik Lakshman, uh, he he writes, uh, so we are able to get the same principles from sciences and inculcate in uh, human beings through education, even without religions. Is it not? Yes. Am, am I audible? Can you hear me? Can you hear me, sir? Am I audible? I, I can. So who is answering that difficult one? <laughs> so should I answer it? Uh, yes, sir. yes, please. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> so the question is about what well, we are able to get the same principles from science and inculcating humans being through education, even without religion, is it not? I'm not sure if I understand the question, but um, I guess he's saying that can science be 
an ethical, let's say, anchor for society, right? I would say that yes, it can. And I would say that it also, we tend to think again, another way of uh, comparing science and religion, it is as if one is about immaterial meanings, right? And the other one is about truth and technology and all this sort of stuff, right? But science has become a deeply uh, embedded, embedded in the formation of modern societies. I don't want to say that science is like religion was before, but uh, we are consciously or unconsciously going through a sort of formation, self-formation process through scientific means, right? Since in modern society, since you join the school, right? So it also regulates uh, in a way the market of truth, what is truth and what is not. And now in the pandemics, we can see how dangerous can be actually to question this uh, this uh, authoritative um, anchor that science produces to society, right? And so I guess my answer would be that science, it is already building uh, us morally and ethically. And sometimes it, it, it enters in conflict with religion, but not necessarily, right? So there's a number, I don't know how is the situation in India, if, if there's a lot of different conflicts. I, I hear about religious conflict, right? Conflicts, but not if there's huge conflicts between like say secularism and religion in India. I know that it comes from a very particular uh, uh, history of secularization, right? Based on Hinduism, Muslim minorities, and, and it's, so it's very different from Brazil. Uh, uh, so I can talk about, I would say that the answer would be, um, it would depend on also on the history of state formation in, in which you're talking about. Right? Sometimes I'm not sure if you can talk about science in general as Right, and I'm not sure if you can talk about religion in general, right? Because depending on the religious tradition, if there is a lot, how you conceive what religion is, and because religion is always today within a secular, sec, uh, within a secular arrangement of power, I guess this will define how religion and science relates in every context very differently, right? Uh, so there might be a lot of tension and. In other contexts, not. A lot of people say that this, the preferable, uh, that there is a preference. So let's say the scientific revolution in Europe, let's say in the 17th century, it was actually um, uh, encouraged by the Protestant Reformation in a way that Protestants were criticizing a lot the discourse on miracles, for instance. So miracles for Protestants were like a way the Catholic Church in the medieval times were using to control people, right? And so in a way, they, uh, Protestantism helped to disenchant nature, as Max Weber says, right? To, to actually, uh, and to dematerialize religion, to make it more a question of meaning and, and transcendence issues, right? So it... it uh, so from this Protestant view in which God does not mix with nature in a way, for instance, uh, there's a lot of room there for, um, let's say, uh, overlapping with science. So you give nature to science and you take care of the soul, right? And not the next life. But not all religions deal with nature in that way, right? And with the miraculous and with... So, so I guess uh, it's a long answer and a bit confused, but I would say that it's very important to, to stop thinking in, in general terms and start thinking about historical and sociological configurations in which these domains are articulated. Right? So I guess that would be my, my answer to it. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Uh, professor, thank you. So uh, we also have uh, a lot of comments pouring in uh, uh, for uh, Professor Medhi. Uh, uh, we have uh, comments from Dr. Anamika Duara. She writes, feeling blessed to see you, sir. Uh, we have uh, Moromi Talukdar. Uh, she writes, uh, really feeling very happy to see, sir, after a long time, my regards. So, uh, 
there are like uh, pratima kumar writes very knowledgeable and connecting sir so these are the comments pouring in for you professor medhi and uh, I, I think that there's one interesting uh, question that has been uh, posted by jagtar singh uh, uh, the question is uh, how much it is difficult for an anthropologist to study the religion leaving behind ethnocentric ethnocentricity how much it is difficult for an anthropologist to study the religion leaving behind ethnocentricity the study of religion is a abstract one therefore it is not a concrete it does not have a concrete step you see among the hindus that there are some good characters there are some evil characters <clears throat> but some of the evil characters are also worship by the hindus <clears throat> you see that ravana is also sometimes worship therefore <clears throat> very you have to know the pros and cons of a particular religion not in all religion the condition is same therefore you have to study a religion separately a particular religion maybe it is a very small religion then we will find that different traits are amalgamated to it which are not similar to that of the other religion we have to study religion because in some religion there are um, you may find some not acceptable norm the sacrifice of human human sacrifice or some other therefore we have to try to stop such traits from those religion we have to study religion we have to know its nature and structure and attitude <clears throat> every religion is supporting the goodness not the evil <clears throat> but if you find something is not acceptable in that shoti daho pratha that after uh, after the death of husband the wife is also cremated such system such trait should be abandoned and for the unity and amalgamation of the human kind we have to study religion thank you sir thank you so much uh, so uh, uh, i think uh, as we have already uh, come to uh, to the like uh, come to the end of the session there are many questions but uh, due to paucity of time i shall not be taking up uh, more questions uh, i'm sorry for that uh, uh, now uh, we have uh, the observations uh from the chairperson uh um i i request professor nitul kumar gogoi uh sir please uh, you can you can uh take over the session and give the chairperson's uh remark hello yes sir am i audible yes sir you are audible sir okay um uh, thank you all for uh, such a wonderful evening uh, we refreshed our knowledge of what is religion and uh, i'll just summarize in very short what we had learned today i missed uh, a greater part of it because of uh, you know connectivity issue however i uh, try to summarize the whole thing uh first we listen to dr mahanta and then professor bruno 
and Professor Madi. Dr. Mahanta and Madi, Professor Madi, they had uh, dwelt upon the basically uh, the essence of and definitions of religion, you know, aspects of religious feelings that leads to the religion as the axis of human society. Professor Maddy, by and large, dwelt upon the structure and nature of religion. He also talked about various theories of religion and especially the animistic religion that is being followed by the simple societies in India and abroad. Coming to Professor Bruno, a very interesting presentation on uh, what is uh, economic theology. Okay, so he basically talked about neo uh, uh, Pentecostal, neoliberal, and financial capitalism, and uh, and uh, you know the role of religious media, especially like uh, Chapel International, leading to uh, the very good. Uh, uh, what is called uh, a relationship between uh, religion, economy, and ethics, if I'm correct. Okay. And uh, you see, we got to learn about uh, the you know, the theory of uh, economic theology, uh, you know, uh, through a book, uh, written by philosopher Walter Benjamin in 1921, where he had said, capitalism is a religion. That is to say, capitalism essentially serves to satisfy the same worries, anguish, disquiet, formally answered by so-called religion. Even before Walter Benjamin, we were aware of Protestant ethics and a spirit of capitalism. And uh, Going by the presentation of uh, Professor Bruno, we also know that many biblical, uh, biblical texts throw an indirect light on the moral principles of the economy. For example, if you go by Exodus 20, 15, Deut 15, 19, etc., we'll get the relationship between religion and economy. And Professor Bruno also used the concept like spiritual industry. Now, most importantly, maybe some, some, uh, some time later, we'll again, would love to listen from all of you, uh, you know, what we have today, the political theology. You see, this is the in thing that I believe is going on around the world, which we need to examine from anthropological perspective. Because what we get to read, observe around the world, you know, especially in China, Pakistan, and now in India, and off late in France. So I, I think this all we can deal with the concept called political theology. Uh, with this, I end up my very short observation and uh, I, I, I am really thankful to all of you for this wonderful evening. Thank you and good night. Thank you so much, Professor Gogui, uh, for your observation. Uh, you have uh, rightly said that uh, maybe sometime in the coming days we can get to hear on political theology and maybe we can have a uh, um, well, uh, another um, academic uh, webinar on the same uh, topic. So thank you, sir. So now I will be proposing the formal vote of thanks. Uh, it had been really a meaningful deliberation 
uh, with our resource persons. Uh, and as Professor Gogoi mentioned, that we really got to refresh ourselves today with insights on religion. So uh, uh, I, Dr. Arinita Goswami, on behalf of the Department of Anthropology, Debruga University, India, would uh, like to, uh, first of all, offer a sincere gratitude to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Ranjit Tamuli, sir, for his generosity and support to conduct the event. I would also like to uh, tender my sincere thankfulness to the Honorable Registrar, Debruga University, Dr. Horichandra Mohanto, sir, for delivering the wonderful keynote address of the webinar in spite of his busy schedule and uh, engagements. Thank you so much, sir. I would also like to express my gratefulness to Professor Bruno Reinhardt of the Department of Anthropology, University of Santa Catarina, Brazil, for his uh, brilliant presentation and presence with us. Thank you so much, sir, for your contribution. I would also like to tender my heartfelt gratitude to Professor Berinchi Kumar Mehdi, retired faculty and head, Department of Anthropology, Guwahati University, India, for his eloquent presentation and being with us in uh, today's program. Thank you so much, sir. I would also like to thank Professor Nitul Kumar Gogoi, head, Department of Anthropology, Debruga University, India, for his constant support and guidance in organizing the event. Thank you so much, sir. I would also like to offer my thankfulness to all my senior colleagues and uh, fellow colleagues of the department, as well as all the office staffs for their cooperation and support. Thank you to you all. I would also like to thank Dr. Tilotoma Borua, Associate Professor, Department of Anthropology, Cotton University, Guwahati, India, for her constant support and moral, and moral guidance. Uh, I would also like to offer my sincere thankfulness uh, to Mr. Akashdeep Datta from the Department of Zoology, uh, B. Borua College, Guwahati, for offering an excellent uh, technical support during the entire course uh, of organizing the webinar. Thank you, Akashdeep. And last but not the least, I would like to thank all our viewers and participants. We have more than 100 participants uh, viewing the program. Uh, so thank you to you all for making uh, the event a successful one. Uh, we are hoping to have more such uh, academic discourses in the near future, keeping in uh, mind the uh, pandemic situation. We can, it is uh, much easier to get connected uh, over uh, the internet. So I believe we can have more such deliberations in the near future. And uh, Professor Gogo, we will be, I shall be keeping uh, your uh, um, uh, input regarding political theology. We can definitely have some meaningful uh, discourse on that in the coming days ahead. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. It was really a nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much.